So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to say a few words about agroforestry in Canada. Uh, these are my co-authors. Uh, Dr. Thavathison is in the audience, and you may recognize the names of some of the others as being members of research institutes and universities across the, the country, uh, which is quite large. And despite what you might have been hearing from Donald Trump, there are actually three countries in North America. Canada being one of them. We hope that if Mr. Trump becomes president, he decides not to build a wall between Canada and the United States because we're very fond of our cousins to the south of us. It is a big country. There is France superimposed uh, on it at the same latitude. But what is of interest to note is that if you look at the latitudinal range of France and then look at the areas of Canada where you can actually practice agroforestry, they almost entirely overlap. So some of the problems that you have biologically and the interactions ecologically and, and um, uh, physiologically, some of those things that you have found over the past 20 years, we have also found as well. That little dot there is Guelph, Ontario. We like to consider ourselves as the glue that sort of holds uh, the agroforestry R&D community in Canada together. Uh, we've been at it the longest of any organization um, in the country. And I'd like to point you to a, a seminal conference that uh, Christian mentioned. That was the first North American agroforestry conference in 1989. And we think that it really set the direction for where agroforestry R&D actually went, uh, not only in Canada, but, <coughs> but excuse me, partially in North America as well too. It led to the biennial series that both Christian and, and Michael mentioned and so we invite you all to the 15th conference in Blacks, Blacksburg, uh, Virginia, a very pretty um, uh, part of the United States, uh, again sponsored by the Association for Temperate Agroforestry. Michael didn't mention the specific systems that we uh, embrace or that AFTA embraces, but in Canada we embrace those same systems here. It's probably safe to say that in the west of Canada, windbreak systems and civil pastoral systems are the most highly valued, uh, developed and utilized. But in eastern Canada, in addition to forest farming, uh, we have a heavy involvement in the development of integrated riparian systems, intercropping systems, and more recently in the last decade, uh, bioenergy systems. The agenda for agroforestry in Canada for the last six years has almost entirely um, been decided by the Canadian Agricultural Greenhouse Gas uh, program. This was a program that was developed by the previous government led by Mr. Harper after Canada withdrew one of the few countries to do so from the Kyoto Protocol. I believe that the government um, set about to show the world that we actually did care about greenhouse gas mitigation. The agricultural sector was targeted because they're responsible for about 30 percent of our emissions in Canada. And so when the program was announced we were very pleased uh, that agroforestry was um, a part of it and this was due to the hard work of some individuals individuals from Western Canada to get it included. So as Michael mentioned, agroforestry first and foremost in Canada addresses environmental um, issues. Um, as of two weeks ago, we just found out that uh, uh, the Liberal Trudeau government has decided to extend this program and we're very happy uh, once again that agroforestry has been included in it. There are two areas listed, agroforestry for carbon sequestration on agricultural land, and most importantly, uh, this one, the adoption and efficacy of agroforestry practices, and I'll come back to say a few words about that later on. These are all of the uh, research institutes and sites that benefited from the first AGGP uh, program. And so what I'm going to do is just start in Western Canada and uh, give you a few examples from there and then uh, move very quickly into Quebec and end up uh, back on my home turf of, of Ontario. <coughs> so uh, the River Rhine system in British Columbia is actually uh, very important to the salmon industry and there's uh, generally negative impacts of the logging industry on salmon habitat in rivers and so one would expect and that is what has happened that the agroforestry activities in British Columbia are largely directed towards integrated riparian management systems so re-establishing trees on banks where they've been been removed from additionally in British Columbia they have a strong strong interest in civil pastoral systems uh, this is again a, a proposed mechanism to draw livestock away from riparian areas while at the same time uh, embracing things such as carbon sequestration and, and allowing um, areas that have been logged to produce both fiber and forage in the future. And so our colleague Lisa Zabek from the BC 
Ministry of Forest uh, looks at the stand structure of stands of trees that have been harvested and then looks very carefully over the years at the interaction of seedlings, forages, and cattle that are introduced into these systems in a variety of different experimental designs. Agroforestry in Saskatchewan and the prairies, a couple of examples here. There's uh, significant areas of the prairies that are actually underutilized. And these would refer to riparian areas that surround the many millions of potholes and ponds that exist in the prairies. Uh, they generally tend to be uh, wetter than uh, the middle of middles of fields. And so the farmers are a little loath to, uh, to utilize them. But work by uh, Patricia Ward and John Court, who's in the audience too, over the years, have shown that it's possible to develop small-scale agroforestry willow biomass production systems in these circular rings um, around, the, around the ponds. As you might expect, shelter belts are very important. Um, in Western Canada, uh, these species that are listed here are the predominant ones that are utilized. I'd be uh, remiss at not acknowledging the, the presence in the audience of Dr. John Court, who I think is referred to in Canada as the uh, grandfather of shelter belts in Western Canada. Excuse me if you're not a grandfather, John. But. <coughs> Um, and uh, in this last AGGP round, Dr. Ken Van Rees at the University of Saskatchewan digitized all of the windbreaks that existed in his home province of Saskatchewan and uh, stratified them by soil type and came up with a total of about 51,000 kilometers that were in windbreaks just in that one province alone. I've seen data from the United States to the south of there. Dr. Jose from the University of Missouri has indicated that over several states, there's about 86,000 miles of windbreaks. And they have been incredibly responsible for uh, maintaining the productivity of uh, crop production in, in the states. Of course, Dr. Van Rees went on uh, under the AGGP program to calculate the amount of carbon that was sequestered in each of those different um, species. Um, agroforestry in Quebec, I won't say too much about it because I believe Dr. Alain Olivier uh, is here and is also going to be giving a talk um, on it. Um, obviously forest farming, maple syrup is a very important industry um, in Quebec. Uh, riparian systems are very important. Under the last AGGP uh, program, a research program led by uh, Dr. Robert Bradley at the University of Sherbrooke, um, actually investigated tree-based intercropping systems uh, for the sequestration of carbon. He was part of our uh, a research conglomerate. Uh, coming a little bit closer to home now, uh, this is our uh, what we refer to as a tree-based intercropping site or what you'd refer to as a silver arable site at uh, Guelph, Ontario. I'd urge you to come and visit. Uh, if you want to visit, please do so within the next two years because it is going to be turned into office towers, condos, and bungalows. So we're actually using the research site, which is uh, losing the research site, which is too bad. They are moving us to another location. Um, I can assure you, though, that over the last 32 and a half years, we have milked that site for absolutely every piece of biological and ecological information that relates to the interaction of crops and trees. So crop yields, uh, enhanced uh, populations of insects, microarthropods, et cetera, et cetera. More recently though, under the AGP program, we have been concentrating on greenhouse gas fluxes, sequestration of uh, carbon, and this is just a little bit of data from our last project in AGGP, comparing the annual net carbon, tons of carbon per hectare per year, sequestered in five different tree-based intercropping systems relative to a monocropped one. There's the monocropped one, soybean, you can see it's the only system that actually has a negative value associated with it. We've also spent considerable time uh, in the last decade uh, developing, along with a variety of different partners, uh, willow bioenergy uh, systems, using poplar as well for bioenergy production. And we've established what we refer to as the feedstock to furnace bioenergy uh, value chain. Uh, we're a little bit unique in at least some of our projects in that we're one of the few research groups around the world that actually utilizes a tree as an intercrop within a tree-based intercropping system. So here we're growing short rotation willow in between more valuable hardwood trees. You can see them in the background um, there. So I will be providing all of these slides to Christian, uh, wherever he is. And uh, so you'll be able to go to this wood site. If you do, you will be directed to a 13-minute video that describes our bioenergy uh, research program. Uh, if you just Google Woody Biomass filling the fossil fuel gap in, you'll get there as well. It's been viewed positively 22,000 times in the last three or four years. So if all of a sudden I see a spike 
in the dislikes in the next couple of weeks. I know it's going to be due to you, so please take a look at it um, if you can. Adoption of agroforestry practices in Canada remains uh, incredibly problematic. I'm always encouraged when I look at the logo of URAF, 50% of farmers using agroforestry by 2025. I'm not a betting person, but I can assure you that in Canada that is probably not going to be the case, and I would, I would beg to argue that it's probably not going to be the case in the United States as well. We have a variety of problems in Canada. Some are unique, some are not. Uh, we have a lack of national policy, even though we have national programs that promote uh, agroforestry for reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, decisions on what happens to agroforestry adoption are usually made at much more regional uh, scale. So, for example, in Ontario, we've just recently adopted a cap and trade uh, type proposition to reducing greenhouse gases, but we're not sure where that's going to take agriculture and agroforestry. A uh, huge problem remains. Uh, uh, farmer attitude. Uh, they spent uh, the last 300 years removing trees from the Ontario and the Eastern Canadian uh, landscape. On the right hand, you can see a picture uh, taken in Ontario in 1907, where the roots of the trees have been exposed at the, as the soil has blown away after they cleared the initial harvest. And so it's very difficult to go back to the farm community and, and suggest to them that the adoption of a civil arable or civil pastoral um, system might be a way to put trees back onto the landscape. They've left us with a huge problem. These are lands in eastern Canada that are subject to erosion by water or wind forces, and it coincides uh, perfectly with the area that is actually farmed in eastern Canada. So agroforestry can solve these problems, but we still have a very, very much uphill battle uh, to do with respect to policy. Uh, the next five years, at least in Ontario and uh, Quebec, our emphasis will be on an understanding of carbon budgets and greenhouse gas emissions in riparian areas. And most importantly, we're hoping to lead a uh, national or regional study on the agroforestry um, adoption problem that exists uh, in Canada. There is one of our uh, riparian sites at Washington Creek, Ontario. They're very productive. This is five years after planting. Uh, we're already up to around four tons per hectare per uh, uh, <coughs> four tons, uh, oven dry tons per hectare per um, year. So we know they're productive. We know the farmer can probably make money of them out of them. The question to ask now is uh, how much carbon is being sequestered in them and what is the net impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So a quick nod to some of the people who have funded our research uh, over the last little while, NSER, Canadian Wood Fibre Centre, and then a, a shameless uh, indication to you that the second edition of the book by Dr. Newman and myself, uh, who's in the audience, Tempered Agroforestry Systems is due out 2016-2017. Uh, Christian and Jerry wrote a new chapter on, on Europe, so there are new chapters on Canada, USA, uh, the Europe and the UK, plus six other uh, temperate regional uh, areas around the world. So with that, I, I will thank you, and uh, I'm not sure if there's time for questions, but uh, I, I'll be here for the entire conference and be happy to discuss anything with you at that time. Thank you.